Good morning, everybody. One week ago, I received a phone call from Associate Justice Janie Lavecchia informing me of her decision to retire from the New Jersey Supreme Court at the conclusion of its current term at the end of this August. I again want to thank her for nearly 40 years of distinguished public service to our state, and I suspect she is not done serving the people of New Jersey. For 21 years, Justice Lavecchia has been a vital and important voice on the court, whose decisions have stood the test of time because they were written to do so. She is not one to decide cases based on politics. She has only sought to do what is right and proper in the eyes of the law. And that is the tremendous legacy, not just of Justice Lavecchia, but of our state's Supreme Court. For nearly 75 years, our court has been held in national esteem, a body whose decisions have foreshadowed broader national change. From civil rights in the 1960s, to gender rights in the 1970s, to the rights of same-sex couples in the LGBTQ plus community in the past two decades, our court has often paved the path of national progress. A 1999 article in the New York Times opened thusly, and I quote the Times, whatever the rest of the country says about New Jersey, it accepts that the state has the legal equivalent of the New York Yankees. It has the New Jersey Supreme, I say this as a Red Sox fan, this is a very difficult quote for me to utter. It has the New Jersey Supreme Court. The words that consistently come up are preeminent, pathbreaking, and even brilliant. For years, law professors have told their classes to pay attention to this court's decisions. Those exact words, preeminent, pathbreaking, brilliant, can also be easily ascribed to the late United States Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who would have turned 88 years old today. Over the past six months, we have felt the tremendous void her passing has left on our highest court and in our nation. It was from here at Rutgers Law School in Newark that she began blazing her own legal trail as the first tenured female law professor and the inspiration to a generation of lawyers, women and men alike, committed as she was to the core principle of equality under the law. That is why last December, the building we are standing in today was renamed Ruth Bader Ginsburg Hall. And she not only inspired the students on this campus, she also inspired an entire generation of young lawyers who had the extreme privilege to clerk under her at the United States Supreme Court. So here and now is where all three of these legacies meet. The New Jersey Supreme Court's legacy of groundbreaking and forward-thinking decisions, Justice Lavecchia's legacy of service and integrity, and Justice Ginsburg's legacy of inspiring the next generation of fighters for equal justice. And fittingly, all three of these meet with the woman standing or sitting in front of me. I am honored to announce my intention to nominate Rachel Wainer Apter to serve as Associate Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court. Rachel has been unanimously recommended by my judicial advisory panel, whose members include, I might add, two former Chief Justices. Pending her review by the New Jersey State Bar Association Judicial and Prosecutorial Appointments Committee, that sort of rolls off the tongue, I will formally <laughs> send her nomination to the State Senate for their advice and consent. Upon confirmation, Rachel would become the 41st Justice to serve on our state's highest court. Rachel is a resident of Englewood and a native of Rockaway Township. 
a graduate of Morris Hills High. She earned her undergraduate degree at the University of Pennsylvania, summa cum laude, and her Juris Doctorate from Harvard Law School, magna cum laude. I must take a moment to pause and acknowledge some very special folks here today, beginning with Rachel's family who join us. Her husband, Jonathan, and children, Eliana, Maya, and Noam. Her parents, Mitch and Susie Wainer. Her brother, Seth, and his wife, Rachel. Also Rachel Wainer, by the way. Josh and Zach. And her parents-in-law, Naftali and Elaine Apter. Let's give them all a big round of applause. I also want to acknowledge some folks from our administration. Uh, obviously, I'll have the honor to introduce Sheila Oliver in a moment, but uh, Attorney General Gurbir Graywall is with us, and this is a big day for you, Gurbir, as well. <laughs> Chief Counsel Paramel Garg, Paramel, great work. Chief of Staff George Helmy, and, and many others with us today. I also want to acknowledge Rachel's grandparents and great-grandparents of blessed memory. They were Eastern European Jews who fled persecution in their homelands, traveling across an ocean to be able to live and worship freely. Their lives and experiences have been singular in Rachel's own life and professional career. And I know that today would be a particular point of extraordinary pride for them, just as it is for the rest of your family here and afar. And I know today would be a particular point of pride for Justice Ginsburg as well, to see one of her former clerks asked to serve on New Jersey's highest court. In 2018, Rachel joined our administration as counsel to that man, Attorney General Gerber Graywall, serving as his top advisor on civil rights and immigration issues. Since October of 2018, she has served as the director of the Division on Civil Rights receiving unanimous confirmation by the New Jersey Commission on Civil Rights. During the Trump administration, Rachel led New Jersey's successful legal efforts to preserve the DACA program for our dreamers, personally litigating the case in Texas on behalf of the people of our state. She helped draft the Attorney General's Immigrant Trust Directive, which ensures that both victims and witnesses can report crimes without fear of deportation. She successfully demanded that Facebook address an anti-Semitic web page that encouraged violence against the Orthodox Jewish community in Ocean County. Rachel has also written proposed reforms to strengthen New Jersey's law against discrimination, by the way, the nation's oldest such law, to further prevent sexual harassment, an effort that was taken in partnership with the New Jersey Coalition Against Sexual Assault. She chaired our administration's interagency task force to combat youth bias, which has proposed comprehensive anti-bias legislation. And she has taken many initiatives to address anti-black racism, including issuing enforcement guidance on the policing of black hairstyles and creating a community relations unit to work directly with impacted communities after civil rights incidents occur. These achievements aside, Rachel had built a tremendous reputation as a litigator and a champion of equal rights long before joining our administration, both in private practice at the global law firm Oreck, Harrington & Sutcliffe and at the ACLU. She has litigated to preserve the rights and dignity of same-sex couples, defend voting rights that were under attack, and protect the rights of people with disabilities. In the words of Justice Ginsburg, and I quote the Justice, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. That's good advice for all of us. In every aspect throughout her career, Rachel has lived these words. At this time in our history, when state courts have never mattered more, the New Jersey Supreme Court's long-held reputation for judicial independence and sound decision-making takes on new and urgent importance. And I know that Rachel will add to the court's legacy. I am indeed honored to put her name forward today. Before we hear from Rachel, it is now my honor to introduce my extraordinary partner in government, the singular, the one and only, Lieutenant Governor 
Sheila Oliver. Good morning, everyone. Uh, congratulations to you, Rachel, um, and to your family, because uh, this is definitely a historic day. And uh, as the governor was speaking, I just started smiling even broader, because you are Rachel, your sister-in-law is Rachel, and my late grandmother was Rachel. Oh, so uh, we know that uh, Rachel is a strong, 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 strong leader. Uh, I am reminded today uh, of the words, not of Justice Ginsburg, but of one of her pioneering predecessors and one of my fellow alumnus of Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, the late Justice Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood once said, quote, history teaches that grave threats to liberty often come in times of urgency when constitutional rights seem to be too extravagant to endure. Rachel has dedicated her professional life to protecting others from those grave threats to their liberties, whether it be our immigrant communities, our LGBTQ plus community, our black and brown communities, or our many and varied communities of faith. She has been a champion for all New Jerseyans. Her record speaks for itself. What has set our state Supreme Court apart throughout the past 74 years and counting is that it has never viewed constitutional rights as too extravagant. Our court has stood time and again as the last best protector of the rights of residents, even when it was not politically popular or expedient to do so. While our court has certainly leveled decisions that we at times may not agree with, we cannot argue with the independence through which these decisions have been reached. This court has stood strong against outside political interference and pressure. This is not just a testament to our Constitution, but to the women and men who have been entrusted with sitting on our highest court. Rachel will undoubtedly continue and strengthen this storied tradition. Under her capable direction, as the governor has described, the Division of Civil Rights has fulfilled its commitments under our laws to ensure that every New Jerseyan is provided equal protection under the law and an equal right of address for those for whom those protections have been threatened or fallen short. Justices Marshall and Ginsburg never served together on the United States Supreme Court, but their individual efforts to create the elusive, quote, more perfect union of our federal constitution ran on parallel tracks. We must ensure these tracks run throughout the state of New Jersey. And with Rachel Wayner after on our highest court, we can ensure that they will. And I want to thank uh, Governor Murphy as we uh, celebrate Women's History Month. Uh, Governor, thank you for nominating and making certain that women continue to be aptly represented on the New Jersey Supreme Court. So well done. Thank you, Sheila. And Terry Tucker, I see you there. Bless you and thank you. Sheila, those were extraordinary words. Without any further delay, please help me welcome Rachel Wayner Apter.
Thank you so much, Governor Murphy and Lieutenant Governor Oliver, for those truly extraordinary words. I am grateful beyond measure for the faith you have placed in me with this nomination. Serving on the New Jersey Supreme Court is the most important trust that can be placed in an attorney in this state. The cases that the Supreme Court hears concern issues of fundamental importance to all of us, to the state and to all of us as individuals, including how our society will live up to the promise of equal justice under the law. The New Jersey Supreme Court also has a distinguished tradition of independence, fairness, and integrity that has already been discussed. I would be honored to be able to continue that tradition. Thank you also to the Governor's Chief Counsel and Chief of Staff, and to Chief Justice Zazali and the entire Judicial Advisory Panel, who all took such care in meeting with me. I'm looking forward to meeting with the State Bar Judicial and Prosecutorial Appointments Committee, as well as Senate President Sweeney, Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Scutari, and the entire Senate as part of the confirmation process. As the governor mentioned, my great-grandparents fled anti-Semitic persecution in Russia and Eastern Europe and came to the United States in search of freedom. As a child, I was tremendously impacted by learning about the Holocaust. I went through years of grade school where I read only books about the Holocaust, and I had vivid dreams that I was living during that time. That gave me a strong sense of how fortunate I was to live in this time and place. But it also impressed upon me the horrors that can come from dehumanization when one person deems another person other or denies their humanity. I therefore always knew that I wanted to help people, and in law school I realized that meant civil rights law. The idea that all people are entitled to equal justice under the law and to be treated with equal dignity and equal respect. We now think of this concept as an integral part of our federal constitution, but at the time the constitution was written, in 1787, many people were left out of the we the people of the United States referenced in the opening words. People brought to this country as slaves and all of their descendants, Native American peoples, women, the past 234 years have largely been a struggle for those who were excluded at the time of the Constitution's drafting and who have been excluded in the many years since for full and equitable inclusion in our national life. And I was very lucky after law school to clerk for three judges who played a part in that struggle. Judge Jed Rakoff, who just wrote a book about flaws in the justice system, Judge Robert Katzman, who while serving as a judge, founded a fellowship that trains lawyers to represent immigrants facing deportation or pursuing lawful status or citizenship. And Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who before she ever became a judge or a justice, was largely responsible for convincing nine male Supreme Court justices to enshrine equal citizenship for women into the United States Constitution. Today, I want to briefly discuss two values that I both admired about and shared with Justice Ginsburg. The first is a central belief in the equality and dignity of all people, that everyone should be able to dream, to achieve, and to set the course of their own lives without barriers because of race, religion, nationality or ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, or disability. The second is a belief in the importance of the law, not simply as a subject to be debated, but as something that profoundly impacts the lives of individual people every day. A large part of my professional career has focused on addressing systemic inequality. At the ACLU, I worked on major civil rights cases and constitutional cases to defend anti-discrimination laws, protect the right to vote, and safeguard the constitutional rights of people accused of crimes. While counsel to the Attorney General, I worked with stakeholders to draft the Immigrant Trust Directive, which curtails the involvement of New Jersey law enforcement officers in federal civil immigration enforcement. And at the Division on Civil Rights, I've worked to broaden the New Jersey law against discrimination, 
combat sexual harassment and the rise in hate and bias, and tackle systemic racism. But I've never focused only on laws or systems. Instead, I've always centered the individual lives and that laws and systems are meant to value, but can so often harm instead. For example, when I traveled to Texas, as the governor mentioned, to defend DACA on behalf of the state of New Jersey, and the, AD, the attorney general came as well, I spoke not only about the legal intricacies of the case, but also about one individual DACA grantee who testified that without DACA, her life would change in ways big and small. She would lose her job, but would also be unable to do everyday things that people take for granted, including drive, purchase cold medicine at a pharmacy, or enter a public building. The New Jersey Supreme Court has a proud history of recognizing the equal dignity of every human being and acknowledging how the law impacts real people each day. Justice Ginsburg shared that legacy. I hope to be able to live up to that promise. I want to thank the Attorney General and my incredible DCR family, many of whom are here today, for their efforts every single day to protect the civil rights of New Jersey residents. I want to thank my spouse, John, who has been my biggest booster in all ways and who has made my career possible by valuing it just as much as he values his own. And I want to thank my children, Eliana, Maya, and Noam, who make me laugh every single day. I want to thank my brothers, Josh, Seth, and Zach, and their families, and my parents-in-law, Elaine and Aftali, for their constant love and support. And finally, I want to thank my parents, Mitch and Susie, who guided me to use my skills and abilities to better the world. Thank you again, Governor Murphy, for this tremendous honor. I am truly humbled, and I will do my best to serve the people of New Jersey.